right. You're listening to Hawk Talk. I'm here today with Chase Griffin. How are you, man? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Eric. Of course. Thanks for coming on. So I always assume like you're you just where you're in the delivery room, like you're the day you're born, someone tosses you a football, you start striking deals with different brands, and you're immediately like just, you know, this celebrity athlete go-getter, like just started that way, right? I'm not sure. There may be a little variation to that. A little variation. All right. So let's start from the beginning. Where are you from? I was born actually down the street from where I live now at UCLA, Santa Monica. You were? uh, Yep. And grew up my first four years of my life here and then uh, moved to Texas when I was four. So I was born in California, but grew up a Texan, uh, 20 20 miles or about 10 miles northeast of Austin. Uh, Grew up in Round Rock, Texas and went to Hutto High School. There you go. And what took you out there? Like, how come your family moved out there? I think my family just wanted to raise me in a place where, A, there was more space, uh, more room, but also a different type of pace. And they, did it for you. They, they wanted to move out there for your sake. I think so. I was about to start kindergarten and my parents, uh, I'm sure they loved LA, but just felt like Austin would be a better place to raise me and my little sister. Oh, and what, what were your parents' profession? What did they do? My father was, I think at the time, working at Fox. Uh-huh. And my mother was a teacher at Harvard Westlake Middle School and Great ran the Great. summer intensive program there. Uh, yes. Now to, to this super day. LA for those that don't know. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Su- super LA uh, combination of, of parental yeah. occupations. But, uh, you know, in, in Austin, both sort of continued uh, similar fields. So what would your dad do on, on the Fox side? What kind of work? Uh, in production. So mom, teacher, dad in production. Um, yes. Tell me about your upbringing. Like what were you, you know, entrepreneurial, ambitious, were your parents pushing you? Like what was really going on or was it just like football all in like would like no okay so what was it no so for me i think my mother has brothers who who play football and, and her father was always big into football but my father was was never big into football in high school he was a debater that was really his thing for me my first sport was soccer cool but where i where i learned how to train was violin and my mother used to you know every single day put in at least 15 30 minutes uh, on the Suzuki books. And that taught me how to train. And I was only four or five years old. And those violins, if you have little kids that play violins, those violins sound terrible because they're like the quarter size. But it taught me how to practice a skill and it developed my love for music, which I still continue to this day. And so I'm curious, and, as like a four or five year old, like was that even 15, 30 minutes, like that's a long time for a four or five year old. Like, were you resistant to that or were you like immediately all about it? Like, how did that work? I think it varies on the kid, but for me, yeah. I was super locked in. Yeah. There's actually, I remember to those trainings being locked in to the point where I would drool on my violin while I was playing. It was pretty yeah. hilarious. <laughs> yeah. And did you continue it all the way through? Like, did you, you still play violin? Through high school. And, and honestly, I think I'll pick it back up uh, with football as I got more serious into that I couldn't focus as much on the orchestral side that I was doing you know in in elementary and middle school Uh, but I still produce music to this day so mainly hip-hop rap R&B dance house music but it's just a way for me to continue that creative outlet without having to do too much physically yeah Makes sense. And so with soccer, when did you start playing soccer? At the age of four. <laughs> and I, I continued that all the way to 10. I used to love soccer and, yeah. and I was dominant. It was really good for me because, you know, I was pretty athletic early and it showed what it felt like to be dominant in the athletic field. Yeah. And I think creating those habits, creating those training habits, I was always a really competitive kid. And that gave me an ability to showcase that every single Saturday. And the positive reinforcement, I got to imagine you trained more and it, like it was a self-fulfilling prophecy in that way too. Definitely. I think both on the violin side and soccer mm-hmm. and with football, it became an organic relationship because I was never really thrown into that. My parents really never urged me on. I just enjoyed winning a soccer game and then coming home and watching all of the college football games that night or watching all the NFL games that Sunday. And I used to want to be just like LaDainian Tomlinson with the 21 at running back. But my parents were like, no, you're not taking all those hits. You're yeah. going to play quarterback. So that that was really the only thing as far as football that they guided me to. And it's one of the best things that they did, I think. <laughs> and so when did that switch happen? How was it you say 10? I was able to play flag football around six, seven. Okay. all the way to nine but 
my mother had, you know, a hard limit for I can't start tackle football until the age of 10. So those last two or three seasons of soccer, you know, I was dominating. But back in my head, I'm like, man, I can't wait until I'm 10 so I could go out there and smack somebody. And was it I got <laughs> I'm curious when you were 10 and you go do that for the first time. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like you're already playing flags. So you've got the dynamics of it and you have soccer, which is definitely not as physical, but it still can be physical. Like, how was it getting down and getting tackled the first few times? That. To this day is one of my favorite parts. I don't really know what it is. You know, I didn't grow up a super rough kid, but uh, I think I grew up brave and, and grew up wanting to play with the older kids. Yep. And that's sort of what football feels like. You know, there, there's a feeling of dire, a sense of, of peril out there that I enjoy. And at the quarterback position, being able to feel that way around you, but keep a calm mental presence is everything. And it's something that I think helps me in the business world as well. And where does that come from? Like, where do you get, do you think you got that from? I'm not sure. I think it, for me, everything goes back to my faith helps me keep everything in perspective. Yep. And so whenever I feel down, whenever I feel like there's something I'm struggling with, I always try to find a way to be grateful in that situation. Right. And by finding gratitude with where I'm at, I never feel down too long on myself. And it helps me keep my eyes open for better opportunities. Yep. No, it, it, honestly, if you can keep optimism, even in down times, like that's exactly what it does. It keeps you looking for where the sort of twinkle is, the light is so that you can run towards that. Pretty a good way to be. So you get into football. Were you good immediately? Like when you were 10, when you started doing it, was it like, oh, I am good at this. You know, thanks for delaying me, mom, but I'm ready to go. So there was a lot of, of training that went into the process of me going through flag and then eventually that first tackle game. It's hilarious. The season went really well. We went eight and one. I was probably one of the best you know, Pop Warner players in the area. Yeah. But that first scrimmage, I was terrible. I think I had a fumble and a pick. It, everything was going wrong that could have gone wrong. And I remember walking off that field with my pops, who was the coach. And I was like, man, I suck, which was a crazy thing to say when I was nine or 10 years old to my parents. But I just remember feeling so down, crying so hard because it was like, man, this thing that I had had in the back of my mind for those three years and have really worked towards, which is an eternity. If you're a little kid, it's like 30 percent of your life didn't turn out the way that I wanted to. But for some reason, I was able to get past that. I think my father said something to me that helped me get past that. My mother said something to me. And we went on to have a really good season. And I think that's sort of a metaphor for how I've been able to excel in life in general. And yeah, do you remember if your, what your dad said to you in the moment at all? Like, obviously you were in your head. I think it was uh, some to the some to the kind of two, be, two peas in a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> screw it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. we need that advice. It's good. Yeah. Um, and so obviously you did ended up doing well in your first season. Like at what point did you start going like, this is going to be my calling to college. Like I'm going to keep pursuing this. Like at that point where you're like, I might be a professional football player. Like did that ever click in? I think at the age of eight, I told my father yeah. that I wanted to win a Super Bowl. So go. that, that had always been in my mind and it's still in my mind to this day. As far as thinking that far ahead as a kid, I think I've always had those lofty goals, but I've realized that the closer you get, to things, there's less value in doing things just for the result. And by keeping a mind and heart of gratitude, I've been able to appreciate the process and realize that just winning every single day can bring me fulfillment. Amen. And if I'm able to have that perspective, uh, I end up maximizing and achieving what I can achieve on each and every day. And those days end up stacking up and leading to the goals that oh, I've wanted since I was eight. Talk to me about the high school experience as a football player. So high school, there was a little low my sophomore year, not really as far as performance, just as a team, we weren't where we needed to be at. But my freshman year, we went 10-0. and 0. We beat some really good teams in the district. And it was a culmination of all the work that we had put in the summer before that season. The kids in the town of Hutto are hardworking. It's a Title I community, but we, we have really good teachers, really good principals, mm -hmm. and we love football. Yeah. And when you pair all of that together, it creates a system and a Friday night lights type environment where the whole town shuts down every Friday. That's and great. there was nothing better than the three years that I was on varsity representing and being one of the faces to represent Hutto, Texas. And it prepared me a lot for the media side, it prepared me a lot for, you know, taking on the pressures of being a program's quarterback. But most importantly, I just loved it. 
It, it was a very fulfilling four years of my life. And I got to see how much the work that I put in not only rewarded myself, the work that my teammates put in rewarded them, but the collective work that we put in rewarded the community. No, it's amazing how much it can be a part of that community. Fast forwarding, why UCLA? I grew up revering folks like Jackie Robinson, yep. Ann Myers Drysdale, Jackie Joyner Kersey, Arthur Ashe, athletes who have gone on to change the world through their platform of sport. Yep. And it just goes to show that all these folks being from UCLA is not a coincidence. Yeah. And even to this day, like shout out Ed O'Bannon. We're talking about NIO in the yeah. future on this podcast. And he spearheaded that. So I think there's there's so many moments in history that as a kid, you're listening to my mother as a teacher read about it in a book. And I'm like, well, where did they come from? They came from UCLA. And when I realized I had that opportunity, it was for Coach Kelly. And I grew up watching the Oregon Ducks and, and them all balling. And it was in Los Angeles and it was where I was born. It just felt like destiny. That's awesome. And so, yeah, pivoting to that. So you pick UCLA, you come in and this big change happens. So the two, what is it, three years ago now? Almost three, right? Uh, two in July. Two in July. 21 was, 21 wow. was the first. Yeah. I think time flies. A lot's like happened. Yeah. A lot's happened. Exactly. A lot's happened. <laughs> so you end up at UCLA. And so what year are you now? I'm a fourth year. I have two more years of eligibility. Okay. So two years in, you end up with this new crazy shift. So you know, for those that don't know, college athletes could never get any type of endorsement deal, make any kind of money. I mean, they kind of, I'm just going to say it, hung Reggie Bush out to dry because he was paid a little bit. And these are people, you know, not everybody comes from any type of affluence. A lot of them are coming from poverty and are working. And the problem is, from not to argue the case, but a lot of athletes, you know, you, you risk injury, you risk a lot of things when you're playing football at the college level that could end up ruining your chance of being a professional. And yet the schools are making tens of millions of dollars a year off it, if not more. And, you know, indirectly, probably actually more than that, but indirectly, they're making even more than that. And then uh, these athletes are making zero. And it's been, it was kind of ridiculous. And so that got changed two years ago. And so all of a sudden you're two years into school and now you've got some brands reaching out and you've got this platform. And so I'm curious, how did you feel about it beforehand? Were you ever worried about like, hey, this is bullshit. I didn't get it. I can't get an endorsement deal, even though I'm grinding and I'm gotten to this level. Or was it just kind of like, it is what it is. I'm just focusing on my game. I've always been someone who's, who's focused on the top priorities first and believe that by doing that, everything else falls in line. Yeah. And I'd had experience with brands. My senior year, I was the Gatorade Player of the Year in Texas. I was the Bill Ford Tough Player of the Year. I won awards for In and Out and Whataburger. Nice. And so a I had done <laughs> right exactly. But they both love me, so so I'm good with both of them. So I had had experience working with brands, doing speaking engagements, mm -hmm. doing you know PR announcements. And I had literally probably over 100 interviews uh, with local broadcasts and state broadcast stations in Texas before I even got to UCLA. And so on that note, so I had, you first did that. Were you nervous or did you just kind of fall into it? Like you seem like you've always had a little bit oh, of confidence, but I was definitely nervous early on. Um, you know, I, I'm a big sweater. So I remember, especially early on, I would have to cover my armpits if they were on video, make sure I wasn't, you know, embarrassing myself. No, it was was all fun and it was all all great learning opportunities right. to have at right. literally 15 when a reporter is asking you what it's like being the face of a town to be able to have that exposure because of the game of football was a huge blessing and so when i got to ucla i was able to continue that prowess and i did everything right you know off the field i got my undergrad degree in two and a half years so i graduated wow. the summer before nil went into action the season before nil went into play i had the highest pass rating in the pac-12 so on the field i was taking care of business and i was our student athletic representative for the male athletes at ucla to the pac-12 council i represented ucla to governor newsom's task force during covid for return to training so i had a lot of practice as far as networking and i was doing a good job of cataloging all of that yeah. and so brands felt like if they were going to work for an 18 to 22 year old for the first time in their company's history that i was someone who could not only generate return on investment for them with my following with my ability to speak on camera 
but it would be a safe investment. Yep. And did you have any anticipation of that? Or was it just like, you know, it's all the connecting the dots backwards, like it opens up and you're like, wow, I've really set myself up well here. Or was it like, I'm going to be going for that soon? I'm not really someone who who counts my chickens before they roost. Yeah. But what I do and focus on is making sure that when it happens, I'm 100% ready and prepared. And so I was prepared for every step of the way. You know, I, I had a lawyer that I could go to. I had my pops who had worked in, in the advertisement and production space. Uh, and I had always seeked out expertise. And when deals started coming and people started reaching out, I can't lie, I was pleasantly surprised, but I was not surprised with my ability to take advantage of those deals. Nothing wrong with confidence. It's cockiness that's dangerous. So right. you said a few things there. I'm really curious. 15, you're being told by press you're the face of a town. You know, you're now, you know, 20 in college and you're being hit up by the biggest brands in the world to do endorsement deals and you were pleasantly surprised. How did you stay humble? And I know you've talked about gratitude, but where did like, is there any external factors? Was like, was there another side to you or someone in your ear being like, relax, you're just, you know, they have this, the Julius Caesar thing of like, you had the guy whispering in his ear, you're just a human. Like, where did that come from that you're getting all this notoriety and press and stuff from a young age? And a lot of times I can actually screw with a kid, but it didn't with you. What that's from? I think just being grateful and realizing if it's only for you, then it's worthless. For me, I'm the oldest of three siblings. I feel like that really grounds me just because I'm constantly thinking about, okay, how can I help my sister Rose? How can I help my little brother Gage? How can I be in a position to where me being at somewhere can lead to opportunities for them to be at the same place. And I have to ask, um, where does that come from? Because I wouldn't say that's innate. That's not everyone. I think I was really blessed with amazing parents and, and, and really blessed with a faith that I have that I believe uh, works in my life. And to have a father who, you know, I know would give everything away for his children and to have a mother who is a teacher, but also has the heart and compassion and love of a teacher is not a combination that every single person out there is afforded. And I think it's a special combination uh, that I was blessed with, that my sister was blessed with, that my little brother was blessed with. And I don't take it lightly. And I think as I get older and older, my perspective grows. I appreciate it more and more, which renders me more and more humble for the upbringing that I was given. Fast forwarding back to the uh, when the NIL opens, you start, did brands hit you up like the day or I guess a week before? Like, hey, yeah. Talk, yeah, but give me a week. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been the week of, actually. Yeah. The Degree Breaking Limits campaign was one of the first sort of collective style deals, not collective in the way where it was with the university collective, but where they handpicked multiple athletes from different schools and did a team campaign. And to be part of that, not only was the message great, but the ROI was insane for them. Yeah. And it set a precedent for other brands to move into the space. Yeah. They were an innovator and innovators in any new industry end up reaping rewards. So I think collectively we generated a billion hits it's for a degree. And so it was a huge hit for Unilever. And then after that, I got a shell deal. So way leads on the way. I was good on camera, but my content production was honestly very young at that point. And so over time, if you look at some of the content that I've done in year two, it looks completely different from some of the content that I've done from year one. Even if during year one, all of my intent was there, I was putting yeah. in the same amount of time, my perspective has grown. So did you, it sounds like you treated this like you treat, you know, violin, like you treat sports, like you looked at what you were doing wrong, you improved it, you actually took this, you know, a prescriptive approach for us. It's like, yeah, sure, I'll do a thing and like show up, do it, leave. Like you wanted to win at this in some sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Even on my first deal, I was looking at the other other kids' videos and, and, and they were awesome. Yeah. But I was like, I want to be the most well-spoken person in here. Like when other brands see this, when Degree sees this, I want them to be like, all right, we need to do every single deal that we're doing with college athletes has to include Chase Griffin. That's in that mindset. Again, trying to be a winner, a lot of times you'll end up there. So... That's great. And so and were these deals, and without, I don't need to ask you details, but were this was this like life changing money or was this just like, cool, I'm getting a little income while I'm doing this sports stuff? I think the term life changing money is always subjective just because for some of the athletes that are receiving a $10,000 deal, that is life changing. Like that may be literally the largest lump sum yeah. money that their bloodline has ever seen. 
Yeah. And regardless of it, if it is or not, creating the habits of how do I manage that 10,000 and make sure it doesn't turn to zero yeah. and instead turns into 12,000 within a couple of years. Yeah. Those are the things, those are the financial health and wellness habits that are life changing. And on that note, like again, you had a great upbringing. It sounds like your parents instilled a lot of this, uh, these ideas with you. It sounds like you've also been helping other athletes with that mindset of like, hey, don't take that 10 grand and go buy a, you know, a watch or something, like go put it away. So so it becomes 12, as you just said. So it becomes 15, etc. I think the, the best way to get an idea across is to embody the idea. Yep. And I genuinely care about telling other athletes how to do this because I'm doing it myself and I'm understanding the value of it. And it's not like I haven't been burned too. Like I, I put a large portion of the money I made into the stock market and it's it's recovering now. Yeah. But I was I was probably down fifteen percent for for a while. You know, there's a you, there's, there's a live and learn. Yeah. yeah. There's no investor that hasn't experienced that. That's not any individualized right. failure. That's I, there's a lot of talk about that, but it's like when the entire ass every asset across the board is down, even right. like, no one was gonna sit on cash when you're hearing about inflation reports. So like that right. would and that a lot of that financial acumen I mean, that led to probably your biggest partnership so far, right? Definitely. Uh, JP Morgan Chase has probably been the largest brand that I've been the most entrenched with as yeah. far as my NIL deals. I think I've done three or four branded campaigns with them where it's just the typical influencer posting where there's a directive. And I, I take the production budget, shoot it and send it back. And it's either whitelisted or posted on my channels to my uh, audience. But I've also co-produced and, and co-hosted a six episode podcast with Kayvon Thibodeau, where we talk about financial literacy and how JP Morgan has played a role in us, either on the business or personal side of our financial health and wellness. And how many jokes have been cracked about Chase Meet Chase? Oh, all of them. But I love it because yeah. in my mind, I'm like, that's exactly what it needs to be. That's yeah. that's supposed to be a lifetime deal. And that's my goal. With them. Lineman right there. <laughs> exactly. That's perfect. And so how do you see this progressing? Like, do you think it's just like, obviously with this nascent and two years in the, the NIL side, it, everyone's still figuring it out. But, you know, do you think it'll just become another channel eventually when the excitement wears off? Or how do you think? that how do you think this is going to work in the next five five years from now i think nil was the first domino on the way to revenue share nil is really just the freedom to work yeah. there's a lot of athletes even star athletes at schools where they haven't done a single branded deal maybe they're getting collective money but if they're not then they're just making whatever they're making they're not being paid for their contribution to the school as a player right. that will change within the next three to five years for context, like college coaches make just as much as professional coaches, like NFL coaches and college coaches, if not more sometimes. So yeah, I think I think college coaches make up 40% of the pie. Yeah. Athletes are around 10 to 15. There definitely is going to be some change there. That makes sense. And so for you, you've got, you said two year, two more years eligibility. Yes. The vision, go to the NFL. Absolutely. Until that dream is impossible, I'm always going to do everything that lines up to that. And regardless if it's going to happen or not, I love football. And anytime I have the opportunity to go out there and practice, the opportunity to go out there and play, I'm just playing the game that I wanted to play since I was the age of eight. I love you, and it, what I love is like you are not just saying it. You have corrected me several times. It's like I'm just living day to day. Like I don't. We'll see what happens right. in the next couple of years. But I'm just right. going today, and that it's such a valuable way to look at things. And obviously, it's really serving you in a lot of ways too. There is a question I always ask though. But what what is next? Do you have something on the horizon you are looking at? Like obviously, taking that piece off. What else is coming down the pike for you that you're excited about? Definitely. I mean, on the field wearing workouts. August second, we start fall camp. And then we got our first game against Coastal. So we're getting our minds locked in for that. Off the field, continuing with the NIL branded stuff, uh, have some some new brand deals that I'll probably announce within the month that I'm really excited. They're, they're large brands that I genuinely have been a longtime customer of. And I'm really looking either on the branded side with brands that I really align with that are large that I can do cash deals with and ambassadorship with and can do lifetime partnerships with or smaller companies that I really believe in where my consultation, my ability to be an ambassador for those brands warrants equity. So that's the point I'm at in the, in the branded space. And then outside of that in general content production with range media and range sports, yep. I'm helping us build out our NIL platform there. And in the meantime, I'm also getting into general production and talent Hollywood style. So yep. 
acting, voice acting, and then producing film and TV and hosting. Just got a couple of things going on. How, do you, no, it's really you know, exciting. You know, I think, <laughs> oh yeah, a lot. And what, what ties it all together for me is my love of investment. So I'm also a fellow with the UC investment office, uh, the, the pension and endowment fund for all the UC schools. And with the CIO there, I'm learning how to institutional invest. So I think I have a good slate of opportunities that all sort of fit together and give me an interesting perspective at the nexus of sport, entertainment, and media. Absolutely love it. I think you're doing it right. So last question for you. For someone young that wants to pursue their dreams and achieve at a high level, what would be the one piece of advice you either got or wish you got to help you get there? Find something separate from that dream that will always be stable in your life. Just because if you're only looking at the result of that, it'll be purely off the chance of making or breaking it in that. And it'll be harder to wake up every single day and do everything that you need to do to actually realize your goal. There's just frankly going to be too much pressure on you. It'll become miserable. For me, that's my faith for, I, I can't, you know, tell, tell others what to do, but find something, whether it's faith or family or a passion that you can always run towards that keeps you grounded and remain authentic to yourself. Stay true to yourself. If you can write out the values that you're about that way, when people ask you or whenever you have opportunities, you can judge. Is this the right opportunity for me? Is this something that I really feel like I can be myself in this? And you'll never feel too minded or double minded about an opportunity that you embark on if it passes your values. Honestly, I've been doing this, I think about a hundred of these and that is some of the best advice I've heard. I really appreciate it, man. So, and, and just to be blunt, you're one of the younger guys that have been on here. So I absolutely love that. So Chase has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on Hawk Talk. No, thank you for having me, Eric.